We're happy to welcome Monica Buckley tonight as we learn about designing and building a strictly native plant garden. We'll view this project from the beginning and see how it has developed over time. Monica is the owner and founder of Red Stem Native Landscapes, a native plant landscaping firm that designs, installs, and maintains Chicago area gardens. Monica has been a butterfly enthusiast since childhood and credits the mentoring of Art Guerra of Art and Linda's Wildflowers as starting her on the path that has led her to where she is today. She says Art was creating gardens with natives before it was cool. She followed these experiences with taking classes at the Chicago Botanic Garden, Morton Arboretum, and the College of DuPage. Finally, she left a long career in publishing to found Red Stem Native Landscapes in 2013. In Monica's words, she continues to be thrilled by the endless learning through Red Stem's work, others working in the field, and through books and seminars. I know many of us can identify with these sentiments. So welcome, Monica. Thank you for being with us tonight. We're ready to learn. Well, thank you. And thank everybody uh, for coming. And um, I wanted to talk about a garden that remains one of my favorites. It's going into its third year. And uh, we're going to look at the first two years of it. And we'll talk about how, what the thought pattern was in designing it. And we'll go through from installation through the first uh, year and a half or so of the growth of the garden. It's a garden in Morton Grove, which is a suburb of Chicago. And this is, a, so you see kind of in the background, the backyard, it's a total redo. There was mostly uh, just lawn uh, surrounded by some generally weedy stuff. So that's what was here. It was an interesting project. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to do a presentation about it because it has um, sunny, shady, wet, it has every, not every kind, because it's basically a clay soil, you know, there's no gravel, there's no sand, but we always say, when you work with natives, you can find a suite of natives to work with whatever your situation is. So there are several of those typical situations, um, especially what we see here in the Chicago area, there's a lot of, um, clay and, and people's backyards tend to flood. And so these were some of the things we were coping with in this garden. Um, behind, the, um, behind the garden, there's a, a fence and behind that is a park with a, a, a ditch really that's full of uh, buckthorn and other lovely stuff. Um, the house is on a slab. Um, so we didn't worry about uh, foundation water or anything like that. So we didn't do any remediation around the house, um, 1950s house, clay loam soil, and it was pretty much neutral, uh, neutral pH. Um, so the homeowner uh, said to me, he wanted to pretty much, you know, have lawn um, for the dog to run on, but he wanted to minimize that. And uh, he had some strange structures and we will be looking at that and we wanted to remove uh, that. But we did want to absorb that flooding in the back to, you know, use it and, and make it into something pretty as opposed to just a, a muddy mess. And uh, then he really got me excited because he said the wild look is OK, because, you know, that's what you get um, when you plant a wide variety of plants. And that's what we like to do at Red Stem um, for diversity of insect um, um insects and um, also something blooming all year long. So those were, we, we did that. And this is uh, Riley in the park behind the, uh, the house. Um, and Riley likes to run. This is uh, Riley running just before we did anything to the yard. So you'll see not much, mostly a flash, but you'll see Riley running in a circle in the yard and you can kind of get a feeling for, oh, this yard is, you know, kind of a mess. So um, 
with really not much in it. So our first, when we first um, a, approach design, we ask for a plat of survey, and that's what this is. This is the residence, really a, quite a small house um, with a big yard, and that's how uh, Alexander, who is the homeowner, wanted it. There's actually a big, uh, um, I think it's asphalt or no, no, it's concrete. So he's got this big driveway in this area here with this funny little pergola, but we're going to be working in the yard. Um, up close, uh, we're going to be working in the backyard. There's this little pergola here. There's a structure here. There's a utilities easement. These are overhead wires. So I always look at the situation and try to figure out what's going on in here. So of course, nothing tall goes under these wires. Um, we're taking out a couple things and it floods back here kind of on an angle like that. So I get rid of all the extraneous information. Actually, I don't. Our CAD guy does. And then he sends me back something I can work with. And uh, here is sort of a base. Um, there's an evergreen existing evergreen of spruce here that we're going to keep a uh, few other items and um, we're gonna walk through these areas starting here. This is in front of the garage where there's a kind of a steep hill here, not steep, you know, it's about maybe three feet from the top of the garage to about here. So we're gonna put a swale to a little bitty rain garden here. Um, but then I'm thinking, so what do I do about this flooded area? Here's this dog that likes to run in a circle. Um, this is actually, um, the yard itself, this is alongside the garage. You can see it's kind of just a neglected garden uh, at this point. There are a couple of arborvitaes, um, the spruce and over here, a weeping willow. Now weeping willows are not native, um, but this is a beautiful, healthy tree. Uh, so are these arbs, except they were all planted next to the willow and these are stunted because they're living under it. Um, so we decided of, of all the stuff in the yard, we would retain this. And one of the things about willows, weeping willows and native willows, and it may be true that native willows serve our insects in some more positive way, but we know that the uh, local insects do use um, the willows and some of the, um, the, the weeping willow too, the, the, the non-native willows. So some of the insects are, this is one of my favorites. They're so velvety and wonderful. Um, there it's the morning cloak. That's one of, uh, now the morning cloak has a, a bunch of, uh, uh, host plants, but one of them is the willow, the red spotted purple also, uh, viceroy, and um, I put the monarch in there just to show you that the viceroy looks very much like it, but is a different butterfly. It's got, it's actually, they mimic each other. It's a type of mimicry called Batesian mim mimicry where they're both just um, bad tasting, basically. The, um, they, they both have uh, caterpillars that eat plants such as the milkweed for the monarch that are distasteful to birds generally if, if a bird eats one, they won't eat another one. So here we had to, there was this funny little structure over here, a shed. And going clockwise around that yard, there was some willow sprouts and, you know, some other stuff. There was even some cultivar um, black-eyed Susans. And then this odd pergola, there's a front view of it. This is that stuff near the garage again. Um, so I thought, well, the dog wants to run. So we'll make a loop for the dog. And this is my first, this is how I generally start just kind of sketching and playing around and writing some notes. Um, and then I thought, wait a minute, there's, you know, there's this flooded thing. Um, and again, here is, here's that picture with all of the stuff we're keeping, but basically we're not keeping very much. So I came up with this idea that we would have, we would have a smaller loop for when it's really wet for the dog to run and a bigger loop when it's drier. So kind of wet oval, dry oval. And this is the kind of thing that I come up with. I, I Lately, I think I've been a little neater than this. And of course, you're not supposed to read this or anything. But this is basically 
uh, a basic sketch that I would send to my CAD guy and then he'd go, wow, what is all that? And then I explain it to him and then we <laughs> figure it out from there. Um, it's a lot messier, less messy. Now, I don't expect anyone to read the plant list, but you can see that we try to go go heavy with the diversity. So there's something in the spring, something in the summer, some, and, and so that things are, are working together in each of the areas. Um, so this is, uh, actually, this is the, the orientation we were looking at before, but uh, this is a little better for us because you can actually see these are um, typical acronyms for uh, plant uh, garden designers. They're basically the first three letters of the genus followed by the first three letters of the species. Now, when we talk about plants today, we're gonna use common names, uh, but for the purpose of Designing, it's very nice to have these nice, neat little six digit or six uh, character um, uh, acronyms to, to uh, indicate what's growing where. This is a um, Google Earth view or some kind of a view um, that shows you after we planted, here's that dry oval, here's that wet over. This is where it floods. I tried to keep all the orientation again uh, the same so you can kind of follow it. Um, the side of the garage is not visible here. It's over here. This is the garage. But we're going to start um, with the swale and small garden area and then run sort of clockwise this way through, through the garden. Um, prep work began in the spring of 2019. We started talking with the homeowner in August of 2018. And that's a typical, you know, Time frame. We generally tell people six weeks, and of course, we don't plant in the winter. Uh, this is uh, the. Um, hold on a second. Let's see what's going on here. Okay, so this was the day that we basically um, sketched out the various areas. Over here, we put um, path finds, which compact into an almost concrete-like. Um, uh, surface and then we put a bench there and I just wanted to show you some of the stuff we were dealing with this is the back near the gate this is well after a rain but still flooded so the day that we did this in install we couldn't touch this area back here so that the wetness you know is back here there, you can't see the wet oval, oval here but it was especially wet over here in the corner um this is after planting. You can see the kind of bricks. We, you know, we, we dug out the area where we're going to put the path finds for the bench. That's another view of that first day. There's the completed bench area with some bricks and some path finds so you can sit and look at stuff. We like to use boulders and gravel, but that's your basic. This is, you know, the day of planting. This is, uh, I think it's just that same um, that same uh, fall so that we planted in, in um, the spring and this is the fall of that year. I seem to have lost, I had dates on these, but uh, we're just gonna have to wing that. It's pretty obvious this is fall. Um, this is uh, late summer, I believe. And we're gonna go back again and talk about the specifics. Also a summer shot with the bench. Uh, this is also summer. All. So let's talk about this little, this is the garage over here. And this is this sloping area. So this is mainly sedges and geraniums and other things that can handle this kind of water flowing down and weird, you know, sometimes dry, sometimes wet, uh, but often very dry. This was after a rain. Um, we put burr sedge, you'll see our swale here is, so the water's gonna flow down here and we built this swale to this small rain garden, teeny rain garden, it's only got a couple of black chokeberries in it. But burr sedge, you see there's one here, one here, one here and one here. Burr sedge can grow in gravel. I actually have some of it growing in pure gravel. This is only a few inches of gravel in this swale. And we'll talk about burr sedge later as well. There's our black chokeberry. Ooh, the dates came back. That's good. This is um, the following spring after planting. And you can see we kept these 
the, the arbor vitaes, we kept this um, evergreen as well. Um, so the, uh, this is a spring of, of 2020 and you can see these burr sedges we were talking about, that's Carex grayi, um, in case you're trying to find it. Um, and these are the geraniums. There's some Jacob's ladder. We actually had to come back and replant. This was a difficult, this, this goes downhill. And we did replant up here a little bit. So this is burr sedge um, later in the summer. You see the little burrs, they, they look like um, um, medieval mace, maces that people used to, I guess, hit each other with, I'm not really sure. And here's the black chokeberry starting to grow. Um, so that was fall of 2020. In the shade under the willows, we planted some, uh, I believe this is um, Sprengeli sedge. It's more fountain-like. It's very young, so it's hard to see the fountain-like, but I think it's called um, long-beaked sedge is its most common popular name. And then we planted um, royal fern and put a bunch of boulders over there too. Now, if you go around, this, this is uh, on the other side of the arch. We, we planted a wild black currant hedge, and this is right after planting. These are five gallon um, currants from Possibility Place, actually. They turn a beautiful, I don't know if I have a picture, maybe not. They turn a beautiful yellow in the fall. And uh, if they're happy, they, um, they will uh, uh, fruit and give you edible little currants. So these are those currants a little bit later. And here is the edge of the um, wet oval. And here we have uh, marsh marigold. I'm gonna, hmm, I think I have a, close, a closer picture of that, but maybe that's later. Maybe I'm, I was trying to show you um, the uh, fall color. It's, it's, it's actually gold here, but it turns a bright yellow eventually too. It's just a beautiful plant. These are the currants. Um, Ribes Americanum. Here is, again, I don't have my dates. They're coming in and out for some reason, but this is midsummer uh, and you can see the bench. We are about to start what we call stewardship this day. It's basically weeding. So we hadn't yet taken the weeds out here, but I took a picture because I wasn't staying with the crew. Um, but, uh, and, and Alexander is very relaxed about his grass. You can see that there's um, clover in it and it gets kind of long, which is always recommended for uh, pollinators if you're going to have lawn, you know, to be kind of, don't be, um, I don't know, I think, I, I think I'm talking to wild ones people, so some of this I don't have to tell you, right? So I wanted to show one of my favorite combinations late summer, blue lobelia, which likes a, a wet not wet, but it's, yeah, it, it appreciates wet soil and it can even handle standing water. And so can gray sedge. Uh, late in the summer, the burrs, and by the way, they stay on in the winter too, but the burrs get to be kind of a, a, they start to fade in color. And when the blue lobelia comes in, it's just the most beautiful combination for a moist soil. So this is right after planting, not very pretty, huh? This is alongside the garage uh, right after we planted it. And we have Carex radiata, which is star sedge, one of my faves. It doesn't get taller than about 12 inches and it stays in a clump. It doesn't um, turn into a turf. You know, sedges are great for many reasons. They hold the soil, uh, they bloom early. Uh, the bloom is not, um, you know, that helpful to our eyes, but they do feed a lot of moths as well with their foliage. Um, and the flowers are used by tiny, tiny insects. But this is basically planted with wild geranium, Jacob's ladder, um, foam flower, and uh, the sedge that I spoke of. And here is uh, the following spring, and you can see the sedge does its little, it's, it's in seed here. And by the way, birds love sedge seeds. So it's a, sedges um, are very good for, for the soil and for a woodland planting. They also, there are many sedges. I think there are 
there's probably an expert on here, but I think there are 114 Illinois sedges. So they you can find sedges for sun, sedges that will tolerate dry, sedges for floods, every kind of sedge. So we have Jacob's Ladder. There's also, it looks like a maidenhair fern I put in here, um, and Tiarella foam flower. This is a very pretty underused um, woodland flower that uh, will eventually form a colony and just, just a really sweet little flower. So here we are in the, um, the wet oval. Um, I'm looking at this, this is not the wet, wet oval, this is the dry oval. I'm losing some of the, uh, some of the, the labels that I had on this stuff. And this is the full plant list. We're gonna talk about some specific plants in this planting. We're not gonna go through each one um, to show you how they grow, what they look like. Many of you are probably familiar with, um, with many of them, but um, how they look in this garden. So this is the dry oval, of course, it's closer to the house. This is the bench uh, and the plantings around the bench, with, which are kind of neutral. Again, the soil is clay, but um, mostly clay loam. Uh, but uh, we're, we're focusing on this oval and the wet one in the back. So this is September um, 2019. So this is the very first fall. And you can see I use I use this wonderful Ohio goldenrod, um, Soledago uh, ohioensis, and it is just wonderful. It's not as aggressive as some of the goldenrods. It's not as tall as some of the goldenrods. Uh, and it can handle, this is the dry oval. It can handle, it's, it's a plant that's kind of tying the two areas because it can handle the dry as well as the wet. Um, so we, you can see the, um, the rattlesnake master, which came in, you know, like gangbusters the next year is kind of like there's one bloom, but this is early. This is the first fall. You can also see the little bitty rain garden back here and the little hill down here. So this is the following year. Um, here we are um, in May and stuff is starting to come up. Uh, we're going to be there pretty soon this year. And that's when you're going to be sometime around then is when you're going to be ordering your plants from wild ones too. You can see the, um, the overhead wires. I didn't plant anything. I didn't plant anything that tall actually in the whole, we didn't put in any trees or anything that would reach those wires, but they're not, they're kind of low. So this is the rattlesnake master early in the, in the, you know, like probably this is May. You can see these three, they look like yuccas. That's why they're called uh, Euryngium yucca folium because their leaves have a yucca-like look to them. Now this is, um, again, we're gonna speak about specific plants, but I'm going to go through just some of the seasons. This is uh, Marsh Blazing Star. Um, purple coneflower. Again, this is the dry oval. And Marsh Gla Blazing Star is another one that can handle clay and loam if it's muddy, but it can also, it can also, it's very pretty uh, no matter where you plant it. It's very tolerant of drier periods. So wild bergamots over here, purple coneflower and Marsh Blazing Star in full glory. We're going to talk about the rattlesnake master, Euryngium mucifolium. And um, I wanted you to see prairie dock early on. So I told you by the next you know, year, the rattlesnake master was going bonkers. It's those three plants are just very beautiful as a centerpiece in this garden at a certain time of year. When you design a native garden, it changes as you probably know as, as native uh, gardeners, so much throughout the year. You won't recognize, you know, a garden in the spring is completely different from a garden in the summer and the same with the fall. And each of these plants generally blooms for a few weeks. Um, you know, unlike your annuals, which bloom and bloom and bloom and then die. Um, there's this symphony going on all year. You have, you know, these plants going out, these plants coming back in, the, you know, um, it's just really wonderful. And right now here is, um, 
the uryngium. Now down at the bottom of the screen, I don't know if, do you see a bar here? Anyway, there's, there's these tiny leaves of, um, of the silphium at this point, the first, like end of the first year. Now this is a plant that you may be familiar with, but this is prairie dock. It gets these huge leaves, gets to be nine feet tall. We um, only have uh, one specimen. I, I, I don't put too many silphiums into a, a small garden because uh, they can take over. Prairie dock though is, is if you put in a cup plant, uh, you may find that it's very exuberant. Prairie duck is a little less so. But anyway, these little tiny leaves that you can sort of see at the bottom here after one year, um, that's the other thing about a garden, not just about a native garden, not just from season to season, but from year to year, you have sort of different garden displays. So this is a picture of mature uh, prairie duck. And this year, which is the garden's third year, we should see some prairie duck blooming and, and looking glorious the way it, it does. Uh, right behind that, uh, or in front of that rattlesnake master. Palm sedge, I just wanted to note palm sedge. This is a very, very tolerant sedge. It goes, it, it will live through all sorts of, um, now you're gonna say, what is this? It, it'll live through all sorts of um, environments. Uh, it, it is okay with wet, it's okay with dry. It's behind these boulders. Now I always put it behind boulders, this is kind of a poor picture of this particular boulder later in the year, but I, I found a picture from one of my other gardens. I just love the boulder uh, palm sedge combination. Is that beautiful or what? And um, I sometimes say when people see that, they're like, oh yeah, Monica designed this garden. So um, boulders and palm sedge look marvelous together. Uh, there's not very much else in this. This is uh, right beside somebody's steps. So basically what's there is at this point, probably a few weeds and the boulders and this beautiful sedge. It is exuberant um, if you don't plant a lot of stuff around it. And that's sort of a general principle for us. If you have a plant that tends to take over, if you put a small specimen in, surrounded by other stuff, it will be controlled um, to some extent. And palm sedge can get kind of crazy. I've seen it take over areas, but I love it. Rebecca fulgida, the orange cone flower. It's a, a relative of uh, Re Rebecca herta, but Rebecca herta is really a, a, a biennial or a, a short-lived perennial. The, the fulgida will live for years. And there it is right here. Uh, this is the end of the first year. It's very delicate looking. Here's what it's doing at the end of the second year. You can kind of see that it's going to be a monster, right? You can see all those blooms. Um, and this is late in the summer. A lot of stuff, other stuff is fading. And you keep that in mind when you do a design like what you, we always provide a list of bloom times. And it's a good thing to do when you design a garden to, have everybody's bloom time in your chart so that you know that you didn't miss a month or something. Look at that. So after those, this is just before the bloom and this is a month later and it's just crazy. Now this is another one that you want to plant. I only put three of them in and I may regret that someday. Um, it's a very exuberant plant, but it is surrounded by equally aggressive uh, plants. So it will probably be just fine. And it's, it's just gorgeous. And when you come up close to a patch of that, it just shakes your rods and cones, you know, it just really, it's really visually stimulating. And it's also great for the pollinators. So moving on to the wet area, we have, I actually snuck, oh, there it is. Okay. This is a native willow. Um, it's, um, uh, even though I have the acronym right in front of me, uh, the name is escaping me. It's Salix Discover, Discolor, I believe. Um, but anyway, that is going to provide um, much of the same uh, insect uh, support. In fact, possibly better. I don't think anybody's studied, like they, we, we know that our insects use the 
the weeping willow, but I don't think anyone studied to see whether it's actually better to, but to produce, to, to pr uh, plant the native. But of course, we always want to plant natives when we can. So this is the list for that circle, which is smaller oval than the dry one. It's got Carex buxbaumii. These are the sedges, these three, Carex grayi. And Carex radiata isn't that tolerant of flooding. It's kind of around the edges. You saw, um, you saw it among the, uh, the caltha, the um, marsh marigold in another picture. So I generally put it around the berms, you know, uh, or around the edges where it's not going to be sitting in water for days. But buxbaumii is happy to. And it has um, really nice kind of purplish seed head. And then gray is the, oops, it says common burr sedge. It's got a lot of common names, but that's the one we looked at, the burr, uh, the uh, gray sedge is sometimes called. I think that's what I was calling it. That's the one with the little maces. So those are here too. And here is that garden. <clears throat> I see lobelia blooming, so this must be fall. Um, not fall, but late summer. And I believe this is our little willow. And um, this is the Carex buxbaumii. It goes kind of throughout. I also have some juncus in here. I'm not sure it was on that list. Uh, this is radiata, Carex radiata, which is star sedge most commonly. I think it's got other names as well. Then in the back, we snuck in a little elderberry. And these are shrubs that I didn't want to focus on shrubs today, but the shrubs all can handle sitting in water and elderberry is, is one of those. Just a different view. You can see the weedy back area. There are some swamp roses here that I'm hoping will become just huge the way they often do and sort of obscure that back area. Most of these shrubs will get to be big enough to sort of blur that view. It's not a bad view, really, except that if you know what it is, it's buckthorn, and then you go, yuck, I don't want to look at that. But anyway, it's not all buckthorn. There probably were some trees before the buckthorn invaded here. Um, but anyway, this is the corner. And here we saw a picture earlier of the sedges and and. Um, marsh marigold that's right here and across the little path from it is the ribes, the currants, the um, ribes americana. We saw those up close. So we want to talk about a couple of things. So these are all the plants. Juncus effusus is a beautiful plant. I'd love to just do a presentation sometime on juncus. Don't be afraid of it if you have a wet area um, because it just isn't used that much. It's not that easy to find, but if you happen to find some, use it. It's a beautiful plant. We're going to focus on the ones in the, uh, as we will throughout the presentation, the ones within the boxes here, star sedge and marsh marigold. So this is marsh marigold at two years. It's, it's a, a glossy um, wonderful plant. It can get to be a couple of feet tall if it's really happy. Um, I've seen it that way in river woods, which is a very wet suburb that has a, a lot of streams running through it. It's a flat woods, a different environment uh, than this one. I don't know if you have flat woods, but I've seen it get really big in that situation. But here it'll probably stay. If you look, if you see, this is the um, foliage. It stays under a foot usually in our gardens. And these are the star sedges that are planted around it. So you saw that from a distance and this is up close. Oh my goodness, uh, Queen of the Prairie and Culver's Root. They're two of my favorite rain garden plants. They're just together. Now <clears throat> in this photo, these are photos of the blooms of each and Queen of the Prairie is just, it's just that cotton candy scrumptious thing and the candelabra like blooms on the um, the culver's root together, they just make a beautiful combination. Now this is the first, uh, I'm sorry, this is the end of the second year. So the culver's root isn't quite mature, but you can see, you can kind of imagine it when it gets a little taller. It's slow. First of all, we put gallons 
of the queen of the prairie in just because you know it's nobody can afford a whole garden that's planted with gallons but i love to have something that the first year will produce something gorgeous like that so here we are with the culver's root right next to and planted almost among there's a little bit of it here too the queen of the prairie it's a great combination like the lobelia and the gray sedge um um Queen of the Prairie and Culver's Root together are just a lovely combination and blooming more or less at the same time. Um, I just wanted to note that this is the typical thing where this blue lobelia is going to be wonderful uh, about a month. This is probably July. I'm not really sure because the date dropped out, but here is the swamp milkweed. And later on, this will grow up and sort of take over the show. Um, that's typical of, you know, that's one of the reasons, again, that we have so many plants in our design. So there's always something in the show. So the next um, slide will have some Ohio goldenrod. It's going to be a little farther along. And the queen of the prairie that I wanted to include this slide, not just because it's beautiful, um, but this is what happens later on in the year when the, the cardinal flower, the Lobelius, Lobelia cardinalis is blooming. The Ohio goldenrod is just beginning to bloom. That's gonna be that rich yellow, goldenrod yellow. And back here, this is what happens to a queen of the prairie. This is the queen of the prairie. It's going yellow. It also has kind of a fall color if it's in full sun, like this one is. But the queen of the prairie seed heads are these copper, um, they're very, they're kind of hard and they don't get eaten until later. So you get to see, by the birds I mean, you get to see this gorgeous seed head right around the time when the lobelia is blooming. So it's just a, it's just a, a plant that gives and gives throughout the seasons. Lobelia cardinal flower is a little picky. You might see it one year and then not see much of it the next and then see a whole bunch of it the next. It's, it's a sh relatively short-lived plant in most situations. Because it's so beautiful and because there are only two native plants that are red, um, the lobelia and um, what is it called, regia, um, royal catchfly. They're two red native plants. We love to include it, but sometimes, as I said, it'll disappear. I generally also plant gallons of this so that you get a, a pop early in the season. I mean, sorry, early in the history of the garden. It doesn't bloom until late, um, late in the, later in the summer. It's not a fall bloomer exactly, although it may still be um, ending its bloom then, but it's a late summer bloomer. Oh, there's my hope. I wanted to show this Ohio goldenrod that's so beautifully sort of pale yellow as it starts to bloom. Here it is in glorious full bloom, as um, my teacher at the Morton used to call it. Scott Coble, amazing teacher. So here is a close up of the, the cardinal flower against our lovely fence here. But again, this will all, all these things will obscure the fence eventually. And I wanted to point out the elderberry. You can kind of see these are post bloom. Um, elderberry is amazing for many reasons. You can, if it gets out of control and it can get very big if you have a small space, you can cut it right down to you know a foot of stubs and it'll still bloom that year. It's a very, vigorous plant. But it's also the host of one of my favorite butterflies, the Cecropia. By the way, this Cecropia has a very large, one of the reasons it's still around, even though it's a big silk moth, moth that would seem to be easy prey. And it's certainly not as common um, in Chicago anymore. I haven't seen it in years here. But out in the suburbs, it's still around and hoping, hope, hopefully down your way it is. This is the uh, this is the caterpillar and this is the cocoon. Um, so this, one of its host plants, I have um, a client who has 
a big elderberry and a, a viburnum uh, prunifolium, which is, I think, the Blackhawk viburnum. And that, uh, I haven't checked it. The She's taking care of her own garden, so we don't go there much. And I hope the viburnum beetle hasn't destroyed that viburnum because these caterpillars would eat their fill on the um, elderberry and then is typical of these. Like you might remember from years ago, I don't see this happening anymore because I think we're, we're losing some of this insect. I used to see these huge green caterpillars walking across the sidewalk when I was little. Um, and then, but anyway, these guys eat and then they roam. They, they, they generally pupate, create their, their cocoon in a different spot. They like a dense really dense bush like that viburnum. And I used to see these cocoons on that viburnum every single year. This is the moth, the Cecropia moth. It is a beauty. It can be four inches across, possibly even larger. It can be smaller too. It depends on the year, the genetics, um, whatever, but it's a beautiful silk moth. We have several of these, the Luna moth, the this one, the Cecropia, and the one that I'm I can see it, the polyphemus. Uh, those are both um, Latin names. But anyway, they're just gorgeous. Of course, you won't see them because unless you're out at night, they, they don't, um, I mean, you can see them. I've, I've seen them. Um, and you can also have them hatch out of, if you have a cocoon, you know, you can watch it. And they're pretty helpless when they first hatch. But anyway, that's what you're doing when you have, um, Sambucus, the uh, elderberry. I, I have seen a photo like this, a million photos like this, because the Lobelia cardinalis is, is built for the ruby-throated hummingbird, which, by the way, comes up north following the columbine's bloom. So the, the ruby-throated hummingbird also loves columbine. And as they start to bloom in the south, they, uh, the, the birds migrate up here and they are just a perfect fit. Like you can just see that beak uh, um, getting the nectar down there. And you can also see the lobelia benefiting because it's spreading pollen on this little guy's head. And it just feels like it was built that way. And in fact, that is the case with, with evolution and with the uh, native habitats that we have largely destroyed is they were built, you know, they, they co everything co evolved. And, um, this is an example of a perfect example of, um, of a Lobelia cardinalis and a ruby throated hum hummingbird. And, um, pretty much every flower has somebody like that. It might be a tiny bee, it might be something else, but that's another reason that we like diversity. We try to, you know, have a lot of stuff. Um, I don't know what's wrong with this picture. It's not supposed to look like that, but that's all right. Um, oh, I think I have to get out to be, get out of my, um, I may not be able to show you this. It's basically the wind yeah, it's not doing it. Maybe it'll do it. Yeah. So the, the homeowner sent me this little video. He was just amazed on a windy day. He loves he loves his garden. And um, this was late summer on a windy day. And um, there are those wires. I'd love to just snip them, but I guess they must carry something to somebody. There's that burr sedge. Love that stuff. You see how big it gets? This is the end of the second year. Gets to be about two feet and it gets to be a nice clump. And it's growing throughout this swale. So um, this is winter. Uh, we recommend, uh, and I'm sure everybody on this being wild ones related probably leaves their garden up. At Red Stem, we have a hundred and some gardens that we take care of. And it really depends on the homeowner. Um, generally in the front, people may want us to mow the whole thing down um, either in spring or in fall, but it's best to leave plants up because they 
are, as you probably know, inhabited by various kinds of insects, including native bees, um, which are, you know, in competition all the time against the European honeybee. Um, so if you, if you can uh, leave your garden standing through the winter, I think it's beautiful. These are, you know, some of the, the ribes and the sedges and they just, to me, they just look gorgeous. Um, I wanted to show you now, you know, you might, depending on your sense of aesthetics, you might think that a flopped over, uh, I believe it's a, I believe it's an aster. Oh no, it might be the goldenrod. Anyway, if it bothers you, if something's floppy, cut it by all means, but I would leave stuff up if you can. And if you, you know, if you enjoy it, there's plenty of, of beautiful natives that look gorgeous and host um, tons of, of insects. In fact, if you remember the, um, whoops, there's my thank you. If you remember the um, morning cloak, that beautiful butterfly, uh, I think it's called the Cambridge Beauty in, uh, in England. It's, it's very widespread. Um, it actually overwinters as an adult in detritus and in holes and in the eaves of your shed and stuff like that. So um, nature is very complicated. Caterpillars sometimes uh, pupate as a cocoon or a chrysalis. They sometimes overwinter as caterpillars rolled up in a leaf. Uh, they sometimes overwinter at adults. So we don't, as adults, so we don't want to be neat. Um, that's, you know, if we can avoid it, we want to allow these creatures to have what they need to uh, propagate. So that is my presentation. And I'm happy to, to entertain uh, questions, although no questions about diseases. I can't do any diagnosis. And in fact, I'm not that good at it. Um, love to hear your questions. Thank you, Monica. That, that was so wonderful. It's so beautiful. Um, and I love seeing the stages of those gardens. We do already have a couple of questions in chat and anyone please feel free to add your questions to chat. So our first one, um, you had mentioned this a couple of times in your presentation, but Ken was just wanting to verify that the non-native weeping, weeping willow does in fact support caterpillars and other insects. Right. It's Salix, which is a, gener which is a genus um, that apparently the foliage, uh, and I've heard people say foliage, so I just learned that from my dad, not sure what's correct, <laughs> but I can't change, I'm too old. Anyway, the foliage apparently um, does support our native insects. Now, I would always rather plant um, a native, because I'm sure, but nobody's done a study saying, oh, this, you know, willows are one of the most supportive genuses in the world after, you know, several notches after oak. It's like oak, cherry, birch. Um, so willows are great, but it's, um, yes, the willow, weeping willow does support to some extent, and I don't know exactly, but you will find our insects on it. I would always prefer to put a native in, but if you have beautiful weeping willows, I, I wouldn't take them out. In fact, that's a general principle for me. If somebody's sentimental about their cultivated roses or whatever it might be, you know, if mom gave them, a, you know, the hydrangea that they want to keep, uh, they could don't, you know, don't, don't hurt yourself making a native garden. Uh, but I would say, yes, um, as far as I was able to tell, I've never actually shaken the trees to see what insects fall out myself. Although that's what Talamy's students did. They shook trees basically with sheets underneath to find out. Um, I'm talking about Doug Talamy. And again, I feel like I'm, I've got the choir here. So you probably know he's the writer of um, Bringing Nature Home and a number of, of other books. Uh, every time he publishes, his books get more frantic about what's going on. Um, so I hope I answered that question. I, I think you did. Thank you. Jim is interested um, to have you uh, talk a little bit about how did you prepare the planting areas? We did not. Okay. It's my feeling that you should pick the right plants. I don't, unless, well, if I have an area under trees that's really dry and I want to do a woodland, I will put um, 
leaf mulch or, you know, leaf, um, it's called different things. Um, but generally I don't prepare. We just take the sod off and plant directly. These plants are very hardy. They have um, all their genes, you know, they're able to adapt very well. And I don't want people to have to keep on putting amendments in. So nothing really, no, no preparation other than what you see. We scraped off the sod. Okay. And Great. That's good to know that you can actually prepare an area with very minimal effort. Yes. In fact, you can plant in grass, you know, you can, you, it's the secret is the plant palette. Mm -hmm. Pick plants that will go with the pH and you can do all this research easily now. The pH, the moisture, the sunlight, the texture, you know, is it gravel? Is it sand? Is it clay loam? And there's, you know, there's an easy way to check your soil for texture. And that's to put, you know, get a quart jar and put about a third soil at the bottom and then fill it up with water and give it a good shake and let it sit down. And you can see the sand will drop down and you'll be able to see distinct layers and after a day, the finer particles, which is the clay, will settle and you can actually see the lines and you can figure out what percentage your soil is of gravel or whatever. Be sure to take all the organic detritus out because that'll confuse you because it'll stay in there. But there's, so have the right plants. I mean, that's always, that's like an aphorism from way back, right, right plant, right place or something like that. But for natives, especially, there's something for your area, pretty much, if you pick the right plants. That's the cool thing about them. And you don't need to amend the area. Yeah. Lois is interested, um, if you could, uh, her question is, would you recommend raking shredded leaves around native plants in the spring as mulch? Yes. Okay. Especially, especially woodlands. Um, now it depends. So if you have, yes, native plants, if you have lawn, you, they don't like to be covered in leaves. You know, everybody probably knows that if you have prairie, you know, it depends on the age of the prairie. If you need mulch, yes. We also don't mulch. I mean, we definitely mulch the first couple of years where there's spaces between, but the, the nature of these natives is they cram together. If you're a biologist, I'm sure you've done transects where you count the plants, you know, in a, a meter, a square meter, and you can have 30 plants in there, you know? So, so yes, uh, woodlands, definitely. Uh, some, you know, depending on how many trees you have, you might want to remove some leaves, but I leave a heck of a lot of leaves on my little, I have a very little garden is why I went into red stem. Um, but I do pile um, the leaves. I let the leaves sit there. I take them off the parkway because it's the parkway. Um, but those plants poke their heads up and they like it. They like it. One of the problems they're having in Wisconsin is that um, the jumping worm eats that detritus and the plants that need it and love it and want to be buried in leaves um, are, are suffering. Just, I could do a whole presentation on jumping worms, although I'm never going to because I hate them. Um, yeah, we've uh, sent out a few announcements to our membership uh, as well about jumping worms and some things to look out for and, and avoid. So they're down there too. Yeah, they're they're starting to spread. Yeah. Yeah. See, we've had them a while. First, they were up north and east, and then they came moving down. So yeah. Anyway, but the 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 leaf litter. I wouldn't even, I used to grind up. I still, we still do sometimes. It really depends on what we're trying to, you know, we have 110 gardens. Sometimes we grind them up and make them into mulch, but just piling them and let them either sit in a bin, you know, a simple chicken wire bin and use that after it composts or let them, let it lie mm -hmm. is fine. Um, but grinding up some of them is okay. I just hate the idea of grinding up a bunch of caterpillars or yeah. whoever might be in there. Yeah. And Jim did ask about, do you mulch? And you already answered that. You do mulch uh, uh, for the first couple of years, but not after that, correct? No. Well, if the plants are filling in, now we'll mulch again. If, for example, um, your yard is, your garden is starting to become all uh, rattlesnake master or all 
cup plants or whatever. And I, I have to say this, and some people are scandalized by the fact that we take out and mulch plants all the time because we're talking about gardens. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the question? I lost track of where I'm going with this. You mulch. <laughs> oh, yeah. So if you if you do redo an area, you'll also mulch it. The whole idea is um, not to fertilize so much, although mulch will do that. And it's important in a woodland, but to keep the weeds down and the moisture in when the plants are young. That's what we use it for. Mary would, uh, she has a couple of questions. Um, Yeah, three questions. So Mary is asking, how do you maintain the lawn or garden edge? So Uh, in your ovals where, you know, you took up the side, how do you keep those edges? We, um, there are mechanical ways to do it, but we do maintain them because grass is invasive and will take over your garden. And that's a very bad thing. Um, I I still haven't figured out how to get grass lawn grass, turf grass out of a garden once it gets in, Mm -hmm. except by hand, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, because generally there are native grasses in there too. So even if you go as extreme as herbicide, and I know a lot of wild ones, folks don't even want to get near that stuff. Um, You don't want grass in there. So yes, we just use a, a sharp square shovel. It's a thing called a, uh, it's got a name. Um, Anyway, sharp square shovel, and we we cut down and edge. We basi- basically cut into the lawn and make sure it stays where it's supposed to go along that edge. So that's once or twice a year. Kind of depends on how much rain the ge- that given year. Um, we had one steward who just wanted to edge every time he went there, and we had to tell him, you know, it's not necessary. It, it looks nice, you know, if you like edging, you can edge all you want, but you generally end up with your lawn retreating, which I love. Then I'll just plant it with more natives. But uh, <laughs> once or twice a year should be sufficient. And you, you know, there's a technique to it. You, you lift, you know, you lift it up, but you basically create this edge that the grass can't readily grow over. And Mary is also, uh, so this, you, I think already answered this question. You, uh, you don't kill the, do you kill the lawn grass before removing it? Correct. You just take out the side. You don't spray it before you remove the side. Correct. We have worked for other designers, uh, landscape architects who do um, native plants and we have used herbicide, but I'm, I'm at the point now where I try to use it as little as possible. Mm -hmm. Now this time of year, I have to admit, you know, I have used some herbicide to get rid of, I mean, there's stuff that just doesn't respond otherwise. Um, so I think I answered that, that question. Yeah. And then, uh, what schedule and tools do you recommend for weeding a garden like this? So, um, some of these larger areas that you have, well, there's nothing like hand weeding. And my favorite tool is a knife either a hori hori knife or a soil knife, you know, that's got a five inch blade. The ones that I use have, you know, um, calibration of, you know, how many inches down you are. Um, That's what we actually have the guys carry around on their belts. Um, So it really depends if you, it depends on what kind of, how many weeds you have, you know, but shovels and we do hand weeding Mm -hmm. shovels for big ass plants. Sorry. Um, and, uh, soil knives for the smaller ones. Um, oh, and, and we use hose as well when there's a, um, and the best, uh, the best hoe is one that has kind of this sharp triangle end. Um, anyway, we use hose for very shallow rooted stuff, especially in the spring. They're mm-hmm. just much faster than getting down on your hands and knees. They generally have a stick, yeah. you know, and you can hold it. And so those three are, are important. Um, the, um, but it's, it's hand, you know, it's your shovel, your, your knife and your hoe kind of like the, we've been doing for a thousand years. So don't have any <laughs> new tricks on that one. Right. Okay. Uh, May, uh, let's see, May is saying, I didn't catch the name of the yellow blooming plant at the edge of the bed. You showed it just before blooming and in in full bloom. It was just the three plants. Um, The yellow flower, uh, I'm I'm blanking on it as well. It's you, uh, not the goldenrod, but- uh, Was it it the spring bloomer? 
the marsh marigold, that's a very small yellow plant. I don't no, think these were funny. the larger plants that were more aggressive. They look a little bit like um, uh, black eyed Susans, but they're not. But it's not uh, Ohio goldenrod. No, uh -uh. you hmm. planted just three of them. You planted just three of them because they're more aggressive. And it was at the front of the bed in front of the rattlesnake uh, blooms. Oh, oh, okay. It is. The reason I was confused is it actually is a, a black eyed Susan. I mean, it's oh, okay. some people call it um, showy black eyed Susan. Okay. It is a Rudbeckia. So it is, um, you know, it's in, it's in the Rudbeckia family. Rudbeckia fulgida. Now you pretty much should look for that. Um, and there's actually a couple of sub variants. They're pretty much similar looking though. Um, but you wanna look for fulgida because it's called showy black eyed Susan. It's called orange coneflower. It's got lots of common names, which is one of the hazards of using common names. Um, but that's what I know it. Yeah, that's what you're talking okay. about. But okay. fulgida. And then Vince is asking, um, do you need to worry about rot at the plant base when overwintering, when the foliage falls um, to the ground? So no. like if something falls over, will it, it won't rot, the roots won't rot? No, I mean, root rot is generally, if you've got a plant that doesn't like moisture in a place that stays moist and you're, you know, piling stuff on it, but I, I, we don't really see that problem. It's not something where I have to train people about it. I just haven't seen, I haven't seen it in the nine years that I've been building gardens in Chicago. Yeah, that's good to know. Kathy is asking, what would you plant with geranium that blooms after the geraniums are done blooming? So what, what would be next after a geranium is blooming? Any recommendations? Um, yeah, um, there's one that blooms. Uvula grandiflora is a great one. Um, that's um, Mary Bells, I think it's called. That blooms a little bit later. It's yellow and has this hanging, beautiful flowers. I was going to say, is anybody familiar with it? But I can't see the who's out there. So, um, <laughs> and then, um, oh, let's see, celandine poppy, which please know that this is not lesser celandine, which is an incredible pest this year everywhere. Um, it's that low growing yellow thing that gets in people's lawns. So celandine poppy is one that can bloom all summer long. It's, it can also be very aggressive. You want to make sure you have a lot of stuff planted around it, and that will take over after. Um, it'll actually start blooming with the geranium, but it has a much longer bloom. So those are two ideas. The uvularia does go, um, go away a little bit after. It's not really, you know, it's not, um, not going to bloom for that much longer than the geranium. And it's possible, and I've discovered this, that depending on the circumstances, the particular garden, things bloom at, you know, stay blooming for different lengths of time. Mm -hmm. So it's not exact, but uh, definitely the celandine poppy is a good one. Um, but what I make sure I do in woodland settings is have a woodland, um, and we didn't talk about goldenrods and asters, but there are woodland goldenrods and asters. You can look it up because they're probably you know, four or five, um, like blue stem goldenrod is one. It's beautiful. It blooms, it starts blooming late in the summer and through the fall. Um, I'm trying to think of an aster. Oh, white wood aster. Um, there's a whole bunch of them, but asters and goldenrods will do the fall thing for you. And they make for a beautiful woodland in the fall. Uh, side flowering aster can be in half sun. You know, there's, like I said, you, if you pick the right plant, you're going to have the plant there as a, you know, likely as not. And you want to be sure to have fall for the uh, pollinators in the fall. Um, I'm sure there are half a dozen plants that you can plant after geranium other than those. Um, but at the moment, it's just, I don't have my plant list in my head. That's fine. Those are really good recommendations. So Kathy is, um, this is another Kathy. She, um, in response to what insects, the weeping willow uh, support, she indicates moth species um, supported include puss moth, willow ermine and red underwing. Oh, wonderful. You know, people yeah. don't understand how important moths are. Yeah. Because sometimes they're small because people 
associate moth with clothes moths and yeah. you know whatnot but um they uh feed a lot of other creatures birds and other creatures with their you know sacrifice themselves to them but they're also they they also are pollinators they are um you know they have nectar they do a lot and there are uh, thank you for pointing that out that moths are also um Moths also use that host plant, and moths use sedges as well. Great. And some of the grasses. Yeah. So, Pat, is uh, could you uh, tell us again what was the sedge used in the shady area with the Jacob's ladder? You you had used was it palm sedge? Was that one of the ones? The palm that... sedge is the one where I always put it near boulders. Yeah. Gray's gray sedge has the mace. Um, you know, the mace like seed head that lasts throughout the winter, winter and is gorgeous. I think you might be talking about Carex radiata, which is star sedge. It's a football clumping, very pretty. Um, I scatter it all over the place. Yeah. I think those were the only three sedges we talked about. Yeah. So Jim is asking again about mulch. Do, do you recommend a particular type of mulch when you, for your early, um, for the early plantings? We use a mulch from Davy trees because it's local. You know, they, they grind up uh, leaves. They put, it's not just the, the wood, it's the bark and the uh, leaves and whatnot. It's just a ground up um, a pro byproduct that uh, we think is wonderful because it doesn't stink. You know, that smelly stuff comes from the South and it just, I don't know, I think it starts to decompose or something. It has a very strong smell. So I, I don't know where to, get that there was a product back in the beginning when i was still using bagged um mulch called black forest and you could only get it at lowe's in a bag and i thought that was pretty good it's not smelly and it's mm -hmm. uh, got a good texture and you know i i always like unless i'm trying to um prohibit something from growing i i like a mulch that's got the leaves and the, you know, that's from a tree yeah. um, that's local, you know, if, if possible, don't buy mulches, don't buy mulches that come from elsewhere or that are um, depleting, you know, areas, you know, that are being denuded and used for mulch. Um, that's why I like Davy. It's just a, a ground up tree basically with all the leaves and sticks and bark and everything included. Um, it becomes after a year or two, it you can only see the, the wood chips in it. Oh, okay. Uh, but when we lay it down, it's a very crumbly mulch. It's just the, the, the finer particles compost pretty quickly. Nice. All right. Marsha is asking, how do you deal with weeds like um, bindweed mm -hmm. um, and agiopodium uh, when you create a new native garden? garden? Do I have to answer that question? You know, I have had, I have put gardens under um, cardboard and mulch for like three years and we still have to do a little hand weeding. It's very difficult. I, I remember when I was first researching how to get rid of uh, egopodium, which is a uh, gout weed. It's called all kinds of things. It's called uh, snow on the mountain. It's, it's planted, it was planted everywhere because it's pretty, um, but I remember reading, you know, if you have it on your property, move. <laughs> but I find that you can you can take care of just about anything, but you have to be really patient. Mm -hmm. um, there are a million different um, ideas. Um, most of these things with really deep roots are uh, it's it's pulling them is not going to do it. Don't even bother. You could even you're better off clipping it so that it's not get doing any, um, it depends on how much you have, by the way, and, and a bunch of other things, but clipping it so that it doesn't have a chance to photosynthesize or give any, any power to its roots is a way to weaken it. Um, and that goes for gout weed. And what was the other one that was mentioned? Oh, uh, bind, bindweed. Bindweed yeah. is just unbelievable because if you leave any of the roots are thin and if you leave any of them in there, mm -hmm. they will re-sprout. Um, yeah. So I have to admit to using herbicide on that, but it's not so effective. It's, you have to, it's, you know, I, I don't have, I don't love having to do that over and over again. So basically we pull it and we pull it and we pull it. There's a lot of uh, some of the more aggressive weeds that there's just a lot of pulling involved. 
Yeah. I remember I used to be really um, freaked out about um, garlic mustard, but because it's a biennial, you can cut the seed heads off. And after a while you'll use up now, I, I don't know how long it takes those seeds. They're viable for a long time, but if you don't let it reseed, it will reseed. Mm-hmm. That's a, uh, you know, whatever that is, two different reseeds. Right. It will start to go away if you don't let it spread seeds around. And it, you know, it's, it's a lot simpler to get rid of. Now I'm not a restorationist. I'm sure if I was looking at acres of it, I would have a different opinion. Yeah. Um, but we do, we do mostly residential gardens. So the one you saw is a pretty typical size and almost every weed that would appear there can be dealt with by hand. Nice. Just, um, it just, you can, you have to be persistent. Yeah. I am looking through chat to see if we have any more questions here. Many, many thanks for this presentation. I think we are, uh, it looks like, uh, so a few more questions uh, back to mulch again. People are really interested in mulch. So would you use age wood bark? So is that similar to yes. what Davies is? Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then Joni is wondering um, if you have any suggestions for getting rid of lesser uh, uh, calories. Yeah. Lesser selendine is miserable. Um, I just got a picture from one of my, um, one of our other designers of, we have beautiful ravines in Highland Park that are carved, you know, that were carved thousands of years ago and they, they meander to the lake. Mm -hmm. And um, we've built a lot of houses, like almost right up to the back of them and yards that are full of invasives and whatnot. So some people are stewarding those ravines and uh, some aren't. And I saw a picture of, of just a carpet of celandine. It's very tough because um, those little bulblets can, like, they kind of screw themselves into the ground and they're like five or six inches down. And then if you miss one, you still, it seems to stimulate growth. That's one of the ones that I would bury for three years. Now, um, you know, if you have other plants among them, sometimes it's in the lawn. Um, but I mean, if you really want to get rid of it, you have to bury it for a long time, like under many inches of something. Now you can also use, um, I, I don't use this, but um, I hear it's effective solarization, which is black plastic oh, yeah. over something which heats it kind of, you know, boils it under the sun because it gets really hot. I think that might be a little quicker. Uh, we haven't done that. I just think it's kind of ugly. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I, I understand that works too. But it, the problem is, do you have celandine among other stuff? Yeah. Uh, we've had that where we pull it out and we try to disentangle the celandine and then put back the good stuff. That's really tedious and we don't do it anymore. You know, yeah. we try to make sure we, we're not dealing with celandine by the time we plant. Yeah. So lesser celandine again, celandine poppy, which has is not even related to this stuff has a similar name, but it's a very different plant yeah. and a native. That was our last question. So thank you again, Monica, for this absolutely wonderful, wonderful presentation.